God forever, yeah, forever. It's gone. What a difference it made, you know. And it, it, it had it had to be that same epiphany moment when when they realized that was Jesus Christ standing before them, alive, you know, risen from the dead, and just just that that life changing moment when they're standing in the presence of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And then he said, and he breathed upon them to so receive the Holy Ghost, and he opened up the Scriptures to them. A miracle in their mind took place. They understood everything they'd been missing in the Bible. Wow, what a time that must have been. What a time. We're in Luke chapter number 24, and I just, I don't know. The Bible talks about we're not even we bring to memory the former things. You know? I mean, how are you going to describe to somebody in a bazillion years from now what pain's like? <laughs> you know? I mean, uh, how somebody does think about somebody like who was who who had, was aborted and now is in heaven, you know? And you're trying to describe them, you know, what pain's like, you know? And uh, their mind couldn't comprehend it as a little child, you know. They did suffer from the womb, but uh, maybe they died of natural causes. And they really don't understand what what's life like, you know? Or when when you're in millennial reign and we're describing to the uh, those people that made it through or that entered the millennial, and we're trying to describe to them what it was like before Jesus reigned on earth physically, you know? We were just guided by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> People are like, weird, you know? There was governments that didn't recognize Jesus as Lord? Yeah. Really? What was wrong with them? Were they stupid? Yeah. 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 <laughs> they were stupid, uh-huh. They were nuts. And some of the craziest people in the world made it to the highest levels of leadership, you know? I mean, it, it, that's crazy, you know. I mean, there's these these madmen in power, mad women in power. And how how do crazy people get there, or do you or do you get go crazy when you get there? I haven't figured that out yet, you know. And uh, we'll figure it out. Luke chapter number twenty four, and uh, I'm kicking off my theme verse for today. And my theme verse for today, Kessel misquoted it, so I had to straighten him out. And, and then I misquoted it, so he straightened me out. And then we both figured out we were both misquoting it. And, <laughs> and my theme verse for today is, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. And I misquote it quite often. I forget that hope in Christ is there. I always say, if only in this life we have hope. Um, it says, uh, in this, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, the resulting fact of that would be, we are of all men most miserable. And uh, it's a fascinating section of scripture. I want to preach on it. I've been reading it all afternoon. I read it over and over and over. Then I studied it. I listened to a sermon on it to try to get some insight. And I'm uh, uh, just not allowed to preach on this tonight. Not today. Uh, some other time. And I don't have liberty yet. Why? It's too much for my little pea brain to handle. And I have way too many notes in both my Bibles on it. And uh, But I know there's something here where Paul says, if you grant the premise of, the, of no resurrection... And the resurrection of Jesus Christ is dependent upon our resurrection, and our resurrection is dependent on the resurrection of Christ. And, then, and there's a co-equal thing here. There's a mathematical equation built into this, and, and I'm trying to figure it out. But, you know, it's been a long time since algebra. So we'll go to Luke chapter 24 instead. We're, ta when, we're going to talk about a couple of folks who were miserable, perhaps a husband and wife, and uh, on the road to Emmaus. It's one of my famous, my, my most Beloved stories in the Bible. I don't know why. I fell in love with it years ago. And uh, and it just struck me one day here when they, about these two are sad. And these two folks are sad. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. Sins are paid for. Reconciliation has taken place. And yet they're walking down a road. They're walking side by side with the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And they're sad. And they're sad. And this certainly depicts our Christian to walk today, and the life we live today is sad in the presence of their Savior. Sad in the presence of their Savior. Let's look at Luke chapter 24 and verse number 13. And we'll read the whole story. I know it's a lot of verses, all the way to verse 35. Some people think like that. You know that. You can always tell people that don't read a lot of Bible. Because, <laughs> wow, all, you're going to read all 16 verses or 25 verses? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we are. Yeah, really. Some people read more than that in one sitting. It's crazy. These Bible people are nuts. <laughs> Amen. When I'm preaching on relationships and stuff, I just tell them, let's, let's, uh, let's, let's say these two are husband and wife. All right? And they're walking down the road, and they're talking. Right? 
And I like, I like that thought. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs, seven or eight miles. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. Now, if you're in a habit of marking your Bible, the theme here is these things. And you'll find that this repeated phrase through the section we're reading. So I want you to focus on some of those things. That was a pun. Verse 15. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Mark chapter 16, verse 12, tells us that he, he appeared to them in a different form. We don't know what form it was, but he appeared in a different form. Interesting. Then it says, uh, verse 16, But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered and said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there these days? There in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty indeed in word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that he had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And besides all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher, and when they found out his body, they came, saying that they also had seen the vision of an angel, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher, and found it even as the women had said, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that, that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things, 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 and enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them all the scriptures, uh, the things concerning himself. Hmm. They drew, as they drew nigh to the village, whither they went, he made, nigh, he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and brake and gave, them, gave to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him. And he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? And they arose up the same hour, and returned to Jerusalem, and found the eleven gathered together, and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and hath appeared unto Simon. And they told, thing, they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in the breaking of bread. Wonderful time. Lord in heaven, thank you for the text. Thank you, Jesus' name. Amen. Things is the theme of the section here, and you'll notice the change in things. The change in things is something you want to pay attention to. As they walked, they talked, and as they talked, uh, they, they stumbled in their faith, and, they, and then came the Savior in the midst of them. Oh, I just love that. That phrase here, it says, uh, uh, and it came to pass as they reasoned together. And you know that's always the problem. You know, it's like two five year olds trying to figure out quantum physics and they're talking about it, you know? Could you imagine? I mean, the Lord was there already, right? He, he knows what they've been talking about. He's omniscient God, He's omnipresent God. He knows. But now He suddenly manifests Himself so He could be seen, right? And He walks up to them as they're talking, trying to figure it out, and they're reasoning together. Man's reason will only take you so far. You know, we have a reasonable faith, um, uh, and it, it does make sense, but there's things in it that your reason will never get you there. And it says, Jesus himself, reflects a pronoun, Jesus himself. Why does it say it that way? You know, He didn't send an angel. He didn't, Jesus himself, what an enforcement that is, that Christ himself drew near and went with them. I, I love our, our Lord and how he recognizes the heart of these two, and how let down they were in their expectations, uh, uh, what they what they were going through at this moment. Then came the Savior right into the midst of them, right? And uh, 
But it says their eyes were holden. I want to know who was holding their eyes and how did he do it. Mark tells us a little hint that he was in a different form. But what's it mean to hold the eyes? Their eyes were holden. That's a, that's a, a fantastic verse, verse 16. It says, but their eyes were holden. And uh, so is the miracle in the sight or is the miracle in his appearance? It's the same as speaking in tongues. Was the miracle in the ear or a miracle in the tongue? Which one is it? The Bible says every man heard him in his own language, indicating that the miracle is in the ear. But later on it says they spake with other tongues. So which one is it? Is it a miracle in the tongue or a miracle in the ear? You know, is it both? Can we figure it out? Where is the miracle? If the miracle is in the ear, what happens to the tongue speakers? It blows the whole tongue thing out of the water. Because the miracle is only in the person hearing it. I'd be speaking English, but you would hear your language. That's what the Bible indicates in Acts. That's what happened. Clear as a bell. And uh, so, but later on, there's so anyway, where's the miracle here? Is it in the eyes or is it in Christ in another form? Appears to be Christ in another form. Uh, but what's what's the other problem? They weren't expecting him, right? You're not expecting Jesus. And uh uh, we were talking this morning in Sunday school, what happens when somebody gets saved, especially somebody religious, right? And suddenly the Holy Spirit comes in, and they're not expecting him. Right? They're not expecting this visitor. If Jesus Christ showed up here tonight and manifest his power here, we'd all be astonished and stunned. Why? I mean, I love it when people say, I just can't believe what God did. <laughs> Why? Why should we be surprised when God does something amazing, right? Something astounding. Right, because we're not expecting him to. Uh, notice these, where these two people are. They, they preferred to go out from the others. They, that was not a safe place in Jerusalem. They preferred to go out. They went out of the place of challenge. They went out of the place of contest. They went out of the place of, of insecurity, and they wanted to go back out and, and head home to the place where they wouldn't be contested. There'd be no challenge, and this is where they're heading. And they, they, this, uh, they wanted to go discuss, and as they're walking along, they're discussing the things alone. Uh, but we see the glorious faithfulness of Christ to those who, who discuss him. The Bible says, and they that spoke of him often, God wrote a book of remembrance. But here we see not only that, God himself went to see them. Uh, we don't know much about these two, but we know a few things. We know that it says in, in 24.11, uh, it talks about how when they came back and told of the resurrection, it says the apostles thought it was but idle tales. Even when the two came from the Emmaus and said, we have seen him, he showed up and talked to us. It's going to say the apostles said, it seemed like idle tales. Kind of like Job's kids, when Job went and witnessed to him, and said, and it seemed like idle tales to them. Um, uh, we know that the, the apostles won't hear these two. Yet Christ was faithful. Uh, where two are gathered in my name, he says, there I am in the midst. We know that these two are talking, and they're speaking together. And, and there's a private conversation that Jesus joins in. He's, he's part of every private conversation, by the way. And uh, we know that abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. And these two were let down. It's said here when Jesus himself says in verse 17, says they were sad. Here's Christ, their Savior, standing next to him, who died for the sins of the world and risen from the dead, but yet they are sad. Are you that like way tonight? Are we sad in the presence of our Savior? I mentioned this in Bible study, I think, with a man. I, I might be lying. I don't know. I think I mentioned it there. But one of the things that's required, one of the bottom baselines that's required for God's people by God is to serve him with gladness. Israel would not do that. They would not serve him with gladness. They may serve him, but not with gladness. And God has, has required, serve me with gladness and with rejoicing. That's how we are to serve God. And uh, sad in God's presence. And I don't think it'll be that way in heaven. In the, in the presence of their Savior, what do we find here? As a cause of sadness. I want to know this. I want to dig into this and, and, and get the human side of it and my problems and sad in the presence of the Savior. Even in the presence of Jesus, <laughs> why were they still sad? And we know part of it, while their eyes were holding. Well, why were their eyes holding? It was because their hearts weren't right. John chapter 12, Jesus talks about that. You serve me with your lips, but your heart's far from me. Their heart wasn't right within them, and therefore their eyes are beholden. Why was their heart troubled? Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. 
What, what is the cure for a troubled heart? I preach this at probably half the funerals I do. The cure for the troubled heart. Because Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Well, the, the thing they got it, we see in verse 14, and they talk together of these things. Things. Life's events, tragedy, triumphs, pains and pleasures, victories and violence. Uh, it all led to disillusionment. And, and that's what happens is, 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 is life has a tendency to bring us to the point of disillusionment. You know, uh, uh, reality check. You know, and you, and you get to that point where just um, Matthew 13, 22. Let me, let me read that to you. Um, uh, Chuck will get up on the screen here. Matthew 13, 22. It says, He also that received the seed among the thorns, is he that heareth the word, and the cares of this world, and the seedfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. And I always notice that little cares of this world. And they, they do. The cares of this world can just sometimes disillusion us and drive us down. And, and, and it's these things, right? It's the very fulfillment of these things that it hears the word, that cares this word, and it chokes out the word in our life. How many things have we to blind us to the very presence of the resurrected Lord tonight? How many things right now do you have in your life and in this world and the cares that blind you to the very presence of the risen Lord tonight? There's a lot, isn't there? And the hearts get heavy. And the hearts get burdened. And, and life is, you know, the rainbows and gun drops are all over with, right? That, that passed at about seven. And now reality sets in. And they choke it out. They choke it out. In verse 18, you, you can see, uh, as they're talking to Jesus Christ, they said to him, don't you understand what happened? I'm paraphrasing. One of them, whose name was Cleophas, answered and said to them, art thou a stranger? <laughs> Where you been, man? Don't you know what's happened to my life? Don't you know what I've been through? That's a great time for dumb. <laughs> Uh, and uh, let me uh, just turn the volume down. And everybody wants to say, don't you know what I've been through? Don't you know what, what's going on in my life? Don't you know what's happening around right now? Don't you? How, how could you just? Yeah, of course you can walk around singing songs and talking about Jesus. But don't you know what's going on? Don't you know the things? What is your head in the sand? <laughs> That's what it seems like he's saying to Jesus. I mean, you can see them both going. Where you been? <laughs> Did you just come from a far country? Where have you been? And that's what he says. Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem? What just show up yesterday? Don't you understand what happened to me? Do you understand my things? The worst things, my hopes, my dreams, my wishes, my expectations, they're gone. Everything I wanted is gone. Everything we expected is gone. Everything I hoped for is gone. Don't you understand? It's gone. My hopes, my dreams, my expectations, but what I what I thought would be everything that I, I kind of pictured, and it, it seemed so obvious where we were going and where the Lord was taking us, and we and we we were believers and we were together, and we were going forward, and now it's gone. It says that some of these disciples followed Christ for all three years. When they got time to replace Judas, they had to draw straws and choose among yourselves somebody who'd been here since the baptism of John all the way to the crucifixion. And they had a host of men to choose from and women who followed Jesus all the way. These two follow Christ all the way. But now it's gone. What are you going to go home to? Where's your job? How's your family doing? How's, how's the, are you going to come home and what are you going to do? They're going to look at you. What are they going to say? Told you. You were the fool running after that Nazarene. My son-in-law faced that when he second semester in college when he left because of academics or because of finances. And halfway through the school year, they had to Brother Chapel had to make the decision to take him out of school because he had, his bill had, didn't have a penny paid on it. And Vincent had to hang his head. And 
the school was kind enough to give him a bus ticket. And for three days, he rode home from California to Michigan. And as soon as he got off the bus, the first thing his parents said, I told you. I told you. It's a fool's thing running after him. You don't understand these things. The trouble is, is facts, right? No matter what you're feeling, these things, there are certain facts, right? They're hard things to remove. They had known him. They saw his works. They, they heard his voice. They heard the word. And they had actually believed on him. He was real. But, oh, but these things. You just don't understand. It's the things. It's the things. It's just. I mean, for a few minutes, I thought I was a woman. <laughs> Women struggle more in their mind than men. Right? Praise God for the empty box. Right, guys? Yeah. Right? Duh. What are you thinking about? No. And we mean it, right? We mean it. But women, whoo, the brain's running, right? Men, we do too. Uh, plenty of nights I wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning. I just can't shut my brain down. And I'm thinking and thinking and thinking. I get up, walk around, and start praying. I'm like, Lord. And God's like, you know, there's nothing you can do about it. No, there's nothing I can do about it. Why are you thinking about that now? I, don't know. I think to myself, why am I thinking about there's nothing I can do about it now? Nothing. Why are you thinking about it at 2 o'clock in the morning? You think about it till five, right? right? You know what you do is you set your alarm. As soon as you wake up and you can't go back to sleep, set your alarm for the next two minutes. When it goes off, hit doze. And you'll sleep great. So something about in between those dozes. <laughs> you can sleep good. I don't know if that'll work. Maybe I'll try it next time. <laughs> he was real. My, my faith was real. My, my, my sacrifice was real. My, my knowledge of Scripture was real. The, the place that God has taken me is real. And all that was real. But no. It's just disillusioned with it. Just, just It's a jungle of events, the undergrowth of knowledge. And some of it's falsely called so, some of it's true. And man, you, you, I'm just, it's like I'm wading through a jungle of things. And I've lost sight of Christ. And Jesus says, verse 19, what thing? What things? What things? That does he know? Okay, what's what's the first rule? That's right, that's right. I, I don't know who started first, Angela or Andy. I don't know. No, so so here, Angela, split that with Andy. There you go. Oh, she missed it. Andy's got it. Too bad you weren't fast enough. Now, we have a guy who's, who came to visit yesterday. His name is Aaron, and a great guy, great guy. And he said, you know, you're not, you're not putting Wednesday nights up there anymore. You can't watch them. I said, he goes, I just, he thought it was great. I, the way you throw Skittles? <laughs> and he actually mentioned that yesterday to me. You see, he stayed working. Hi, Aaron. I hope you're watching. I don't know if we're online. Are we online, Chuck? So, Aaron, if you're watching, God bless you. And uh, he said, happy Easter this morning. And uh, he said, the way you throw Skittles was great. He says, I always laughed when you did that. Amen. So I did that for you, Aaron, and, uh, and for Angela and Andy. <laughs> Jesus is God. He's always God. He's never not God. And he says, what things? Well, obviously, he wants them to say to come out. What things? Let me, I mean, what has shaken your belief? Listen, it's shaken you to the core. But when you got down to that core, are you saying that a solid rock? What has shaken you? Exactly what is the problem? Uh, uh, articulate to me why. Why? Articulate to me why you don't believe anymore. Why have you quit? Put it in words. Tell me what things. Why are you where you are? It's a good question. Why are you where you are? Or you could put it this way. How did you get here? Or you could say, what things? What, what things has driven Christ from your heart? What things? It's true. It's real. Through much tribulation, we were sent to the kingdom. In this world, you will have trouble. Amen? This light affliction, which is but for a moment. Light affliction, God? For we which are alive are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. Well, there's an encouraging verse. 
We are troubled on every side. We are perplexed. We are persecuted. Paul uh, there is describing the ministry. He says we're squeezed. Uh, he says uh, we're perplexed, which means there is no way out. <laughs> there, there, there is no way out. And he says we're persecuted. The idea is suffered. And he says, and we're cast down. This means just thrown to the ground. And that's, that's, that's Paul's description of his ministry life. Of course, you read the rest of the description. It can be a little more encouraging. Jesus says, what things? What things? What things? Verse 21 is an amazing verse. When it comes in, and, uh, uh, and we see the, the root of the problem gets exposed. And of course, Christ is going to bring the root of the problem that, that comes out, right? And it says, but we trusted. I remember the day when I trusted. And I don't anymore. I remember the day when I knew the Lord would take care of me. I don't dare live without health insurance now. Man, retirement's not that far away now. I better start planning hard. Yeah, it was just young, stupid nativity of youth that didn't plan for the future and said, I just trust the Lord. That was just ignorance and stupidity. That wasn't faith. Now that I'm more mature and settled, I, I have, my faith is, you know, it's matured. You know, because God takes care of those that take care of themselves. Boy, is that, what things? What, what happened to seek first the kingdom of God? And, and all these things shall be added unto you. Well, yeah, but God wasn't saying. Then pray tell, what was he saying? Well, you don't understand. When you retire, what are you going to do? I keep looking. I think Strong's made an error in his concordance because I can't find retired in my Bible. Amen. And I just keep looking, and I just keep looking, and I just keep looking, and, and I keep thinking, Lord, what do I do when I retire? And then I searched and searched and searched, and you know, and... There's some things in here about gray hair and the gray-headed, right? We won't mention the bald head. It'd be gray if you let it grow, brother, right? When I'm old, will the Lord forsake me? Has his promises become void now? What things? What's, what, what is it that has shaken me to the point now that, that you can no longer walk that road? It just didn't happen the way I thought it was supposed to happen. He should have redeemed Israel. Look at verse 21. And we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. We had it all figured out. We knew, but, but he didn't. Really? Are you sure God's just not doing something that you're not aware of? Are you sure? The atheist says, I looked everywhere and didn't find God. Well, that's because every time you look over there, he moves over there. You ever play hide and seek with God? Good luck. What's closed my heart and my eyes? And besides all this, verse 21, and besides all this, besides all what? Right? Besides all this. Verse 21 says, and besides all this, all these things, and all of our, 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 our hopes and dreams and our faith and how we had trusted and, and we, were, we were just serving and we were happy and we were rejoicing and we watched them, them leaping for joy. And we watched them fed and we watched it and, the, and people were getting saved and the ministry was dynamic. And, and then these things. And then now we just walked away. And now I'm just looking back, and Jerusalem's way over there. And what are we going back? Well, we're going to go back home. And besides all this, what these things, and my lost faith, and my lost hope, it's been a long time. Besides all this, today's the third day. He should have done something by now if he was going to do it. 
That's what my pastor told me about Bradford. Almost the exact words. We were heading down, and we were going to go down to Bradford, and, and Pastor Cook was up at our church, and, um, and yes, I'll, I will come down. We'll work together, the plant church in Bradford. And, and I sat in the office talking to the pastor about it, and I said, well, you know, I'm going to be sent from the church, Dr. Roach, and what do you think? And he said, if anything, good be, if anything great could be done in Bradford, it had been done by now. Why would a man of faith and a great man of God say that to me? I think he was testing that old preacher boy to see what kind of salt it was made out of. All right? So, well, bless God, we'll try to do something. I sat at a table and uh, I was a little bit just struggling a little bit with purpose and reason and meaning. And I was just voicing some of it to Justin. And uh, I was at the bus garage and Justin, big tall Justin back there, was sitting there. And, uh, and he just, he kind of moved a little bit and he goes, Well, you made a difference in somebody's life. He says, you're, you really made a difference to me. He said, if it was just one person that made it worth it all. Well, you, man, I tell you what, I was like, dude. That, and then later I was walking around going, man, thank you. That's just, you know, what a lift of spirits. Boy, what a, what a good guy. I like Justin now. <laughs> it had been a long time. A long time. And if he was going to do something, he should have done it by now. Trials seem so long. They're so much longer than they think they should be. I mean, can't you just say, okay, God, I get it. I've learned my lesson, God. God says, have you? The master of assemblies, does he know? Oh, ye of little faith, trust in me. What happened to, that's not my will but thine. Amen. What happened to that great, um, are we trying to give God permission? Are we allowing him <laughs> Shall God be subject to me? Give in, O saint, give in to his will. I wrote that at the bottom of my page. I love the song, Rejoice in the Lord. One of the phrases, and I think it's the second verse, when uh, uh, Brother Ron Hamilton writes, I bow to the will of the master that day. And I, wow. God is not fighting with me. I'm fighting with him. The war is not on his end. The war is only on my end. And there's only one solution to this battle, and that's surrender. And when I surrender to God, there's perfect peace in my life. The peace of God that passeth all understanding comes when you raise the white flag of your own will and allow yourself to succumb to his. And as long as you're fighting it, and that's what's happening in these people's heart, is they're fighting what they fought. Jesus confronts the nature of our problems lovingly and tenderly, but directly. And you don't always think directly is tender and loving, but it is, and it should be. In verse number 25, Jesus, he looks right at Cleophas and right at whoever his wife is or the, his friend is, and he says, O oh, fools, and slow of heart to believe. All the prophets have spoken. Slow of heart. I'm glad he didn't say slow of head. In other places, you'll say dull of hearing. But here he says slow. It's a slow heart. Not stopped. Not, not moving, just slow. The Bible talks much about the heart. It says, uh, it says the wisdom of the heart. Ah, that's neat. Sorrow of the heart. It says, by the sorrow of the heart, the, but the spirit's broken. It says, astonishment of heart that can happen. Gladness of heart. It mentions uh, an offense to the heart. It talks about a heart that is upright within him. Uh, it says, the larging of our heart, the large heart. It talks about the integrity of the heart, the broken heart, the clean heart, the pure heart, the bitter heart. And it, it talks about a single heart. It also talks about anguish of heart. There's many, many different times. I love to study the scriptures and stuff like that. It talks about spirits or hearts. and How many different ways God mentions the heart? And the Bible says the Lord seeth the heart. He, he knows what's, what's, what are these guys' hearts? Anguish? Broken? Bitter? No. God says slow. Their hearts, the problem they had was a slow heart. 
all these problems, all these heart problems <clears throat> that are found in the scriptures, uh, but here it's slowness. What's taking so long for their heart? Why is the heart so slow to move? What, what is it so slow? When will you believe? How much longer will it take? Here it says, oh, fools. Now, fools contrast in our Bible with wisdom so often. And uh, the idea of fool is not necessarily unintelligent. The idea of the fool is sensual. It's somebody that relies on their senses. What I see, what I feel, what I taste, what I smell. Relying on senses rather than the word of God. Slow to believe or to fully commit. The foolish is relying on their senses and slow to commit to the things of the Spirit of God. Slow to commit to spiritual things. And what's in the way is foolishness, which is sensuality, relying on senses and sense data. Slow to believe, slow to commit. At what point is full commitment? I remember the time I was. When will you give in and give it your all? To give it your all, you need to trust. The killer is, yeah, but what if? What if? What ifs? What ifs will kill, kill commitment. In verse number 25, you see, you see him talk, he says, we believe some. We believe some. And, and all of us believe some to different degrees. And, and he says, slow of heart to believe all. Slow of heart to believe all. We all believe some, right? All different degrees. But do you believe all that the prophets have spoken? All. To, to, to swallow God's word whole. To believe it all. To believe it all. I don't understand it all. Can you believe it all? The difference between great Christians and just another believer, both are saved, both are on their way to heaven. But one believes some, and the other believes all. That's the difference. That's, Christian, it's, it's time to pick up your torch. It's time to take that torch back in your hand. It's your turn. I love it when it says in Psalms, it says, the lines have fallen unto me. The lines have fallen to us. It doesn't matter what they did in Bolivar Drive Baptist Church in 1960. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what they did in 1980. It doesn't matter what Central Baptist did uh, back there in the 80s and 90s. It doesn't matter what Bradford Baptist did in the, in the, in the 2010 area. It doesn't matter who you won to Christ 10 years ago. It doesn't matter. The lines have fallen to us now, here, today. Oh, yeah, but... You just don't understand. It was different back in the 60s. It was so pure and clean. Society was so much more holy. I mean, in the 70s, definitely, things cleaned up. And I mean, come on now. It was easy to win those guys out there on the disco floor. I remember the 80s, you know. And wooden souls just wasn't that hard back then. But, but you know, it, but right now we just have these things. As pandemics shut down churches. As war stop everybody in their tracks. And, and, and fear grips hearts. And, and we're all struggling because of inflation. How in the world are we going to even put food on the table? I mean... Good guy, have you seen the grocery bill? I went to the tops and about, about fell over. They had to resuscitate me. <laughs> oh, good grief. My wife says, well, we're done eating chicken. That's all we eat is chicken. She said, it's $3 for breast, $3 a pound. We're not buying it no more. If you're done with chicken, we can't be Baptist. What, what are we going to do? <laughs> what's, what's after chicken? Rat? Muskrat? I mean, there's not much lower than chicken, honey. We can't go much lower than that. She says, no more chicken. Wow. That's why we're raising big dogs now. That's right. Just in case it gets bad. 
But you don't understand how hard this thing, I mean, it's so busy now. There's so many things. It's so hard to make a living. And we're two family incomes now. And if you only have one income, whoa, to that family. And, man, just, and the things and the cars and the junk. And, man, we live off the world's trash. That's what we drive. It's different now. It's just these things. Do we have the truth? Or is there possibly a different way? Do we have a truth? Or is it, is it, is it lost its power? Well, go bring one person to church. Bring one. Don't, don't set your goal on 600 people this year. You won't do it. One. You, you say, yeah, but the only person I could bring don't look that great. <laughs> they make funny noises and they kind of drool. They'll fit right in. <laughs> don't you worry. Don't you worry. Pick up somebody for church. Go visit somebody. Read your Bible through this year. Pray pray like you're having a conversation with God. Spend some time with the Lord. Seek first the kingdom. It's the cure for sadness is given right inside the text, which is great. The solution to these things and the solution to the slow heart and the solution to the little faith. He says, oh, you have little faith, right? What is it? Well, it's simple. Verse 32. And Jesus Christ, of course, he disappears from their midst. How sad that moment was. And they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us? Is that an indication that there are a couple, one heart for two people? Did not our heart burn within us while, we ta while he talked with us by the way? And look at what they described what Jesus did. And while he opened to us the scriptures. Preaching is the only cure for these things, for little faith, for the slow heart. That's the preaching of the whole word of God. He opened their hearts, and he, and he said our hearts began to burn. That word literally means to light up. Our hearts lit up. It, they kindled. It was a change in our heart that was wrought by the scriptures being opened up before us. The fire from the pulpit began to light up their hearts and consume their doubts. As we hear the scriptures expounded, the light from the scripture scatters the darkness that is on our hearts. It says our hearts burned within us while, we, while, he, while he talked to us, by the way, and he opened to us the scriptures. The preaching is the cure. It's the Bible that opened in the study of the scriptures. I don't care if it's a if it's a one-on-one -on -one Bible study, if you're discipling somebody or somebody's discipling you, it's a small group, or whether it's preaching of the word, or whether it's a Sunday school class, whether it's one to another or from the pulpit, it's the it's the opening up of the scriptures and it's God's word. Faith come by and hearing by. The word of God, foolishness of preaching. God hath chosen the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Preaching changes life. Change, preaching burns out wickedness. Uh, preaching encourages our faith and increases our knowledge. It gives us understanding. It saves the lost. It lightens the dark spots in our lives. It revives and strengthens in weak times. That's what preaching and teaching of the scriptures does. Preaching is the power of God to save, to change. It's the power of God to empower and to equip. It's the preaching. It, it's what it does. We preach not ourselves, but Christ and Him crucified. Why? It's the wisdom and the power of God. That's the cure. Solution, right? What? Number one, get under the preaching of God's Word. We have three services a week and multiple Bible studies a week. Why? Because your preacher's nuts. Okay, but what's the second reason? <laughs> The solution number two, right? Solution number two, verse 30. And it came to pass, he sat at meat with them, he took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave to them. It's time to have some communion with the Lord. Just spend some time with him. Jesus says, he obeyed my commandments, and my, and my father will come into him and sup with him. To spend some communion time with the Lord. Take of his bread, the word of God. Watch him break it for you into bite-sized pieces. And he'll begin to feed you. And you will partake with him. And what happened? And his eyes were opened, it says. It says, and their eyes were opened. The great, great cry in Philippians, oh, that I might know him. Right? Is that just to know him? It's all he says, right? What's he say? We all like the power. What comes before that? 
the fellowship of his sufferings. I may partake with him and, and know him. And that's the cure uh, for being sad in the presence of your Savior. Right? And uh, There's no reason for a Christian to ever be downhearted, is there? But aren't we? Yeah. Why? These things. These things. What do they battle against? My faith. My faith. How many of you remember what you once were? How many of you were better before than you are now? Well, that's called backslidden. You've gone back from what you once were. Right? How long does it take to get back? How, how, in, in our story of the prodigal son, how far was the journey home? It said he took a long journey. And he came to himself and said, my father. And he turned, and the very next verse, he was there. It took him a long time to get there, but it took him instantaneously to get within sight of the Father. I love the way our Bible's written. All right? It's not hard to get back to what you once were. Right? That's the beauty of backsliding. What? It's not hard to get back there. All right? To get back. Because that's where the Lord wants to take you. Right? You say, well, I was never been there. I don't remember a time. <laughs> Well, guess where God wants to take you, right? Right? He's going to take you through the jungle of all these things. And you see Christ on the other side. Let's pray and we'll partake of the supper. Father in heaven, it's good to be in the house of God tonight just to open up the scriptures and see what God has for us. I love the word of God. I love the directness of it. I'd love to be walking in the way and have Christ walk up beside me to see you stand there and have you talk with me. And God, to hear that sermon you preached that day as you began with Moses and the prophets and just expounded the scriptures. Oh, to be a fly in the wall. We have something better. We have the Holy Ghost, the author of the book, within us, telling us and showing us. Oh, Father, thank you so much. I pray you bless us, Jesus, this night. Encourage the brokenhearted. Help the hurting. To strengthen the weak, Lord. And those that are, are walking for the Lord and, and walking across that hilltop, God, bless them and, and give them great grace and great glory. And they might be an example to us to walk pleasing to the Lord. Thank you for this night. Bless the communion supper in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Kessel, if you come up.